Welcome to the Pop Cult Podcast. Here are your hosts Ariana and Seth. I'm Seth. I'm Ariana. And this is the Pop Cult Podcast. Uh, once again, we've got two new films to review for you. A little later, we'll be looking at the film uh, Return to Soul. Uh, but first up, we're going to be talking about a thousand and one. A thousand and one is currently streaming on Peacock. It's mislabeled on Google as a mystery. I don't think it meets that at all. This is a, a drama. Uh, unapologetic and free spirited Inez, played by Tiana Taylor, kidnaps her six year old son Terry from the foster care system. They set out to reclaim their sense of home, identity, and stability in a rapidly changing New York City. This is the debut feature from uh, Black female director A.V. Rockwell and is, as I think I said, was streaming on Peacock right now. You can watch it. I think you have to have premium Peacock or something. Uh, So, Ariana, what did you think of A Thousand and One? Uh, I think the best and strongest character is Inez, Mm -hmm. played by, how do you say her name? I said her name in the intro. I guess you just weren't listening. Tiana Taylor. Tiana Taylor. And she is one of those women that I feel like when we lived in the States, I have met this woman. Oh, yeah. I have met this oh, yeah. woman before. I've seen this woman at like school functions and things. Yeah, yeah. Like met her before. She's not someone that I personally would feel like intimidated by, but you could probably feel like that someone else who has a certain ideology would not yeah. get involved the, well, with. The character of Inez is someone who does not have time for people's bullshit. No. And so if you're someone who kind of wears a mask or is very phony about who you are, this Inez isn't going to put up with it for very yeah. long. She might call you out on it. Yes. Um, I think most of the adult cast, I say most, and some of the child acting was pretty good, except for older Terry that was played by joshua cross josiah cross josiah cross that was pretty weak for me and so it kind of fell through the cracks when started focusing on him a little bit more um the way that you could view this movie is basically um the view of black black culture in the midst of being gentrified like from their neighborhood because it takes place over about eight to 10 years in New York city. So from like the mid nineties to around the mid two thousands. Yeah. And in the background, there's always this kind of hint that neighborhoods are being taken away and transformed. And it's something that is not like the overt message of the film, but it's clearly happening around the characters, which is the way you would experience it. You're not going to go outside and go, oh, wow, the neighborhood's been gentrified. It's You're going to notice, well, that building's being renovated. It really stands out in the neighborhood. More buildings get renovated. People start moving into the neighborhood who you normally wouldn't expect to see there. Yeah. And slowly but surely, it's not your neighborhood anymore. These people have come in and taken it over. Yeah, and there was also, like, at the least background, a lot of times when you had, like, these um, drone shots of New York while you had different uh, mayors talking about what they're going to do, uh, uh, like, what they're going to do, how they're going to change the neighborhood. It's Giuliani and Bloomberg, they um, use their audio. Yeah. And so they use those audios, and then we see Terry as a teenager being stopped, and being to the point that he's not being arrested but he is being checked upon to uh, stop and frisk stop and frisk where he like his own freedom to walk around his neighborhood is being taken away from him there is also at the least there is some black joy that you get to watch in this movie and i think a lot of times when you watch movies like this you end up holding your breath as to, okay, is a teenager going to die? Is a mom going to die? Like, through, like, a well, cop. Well, like, Precious is a movie yeah. where you're just, it's a well-made movie. It is was made by Black people, starring Black people. But God, does that movie present, like, a miserable view of yeah. life. And so, yeah, I think this is in a similar vein, but slightly more grounded and not as exaggerated as precious kind of got at certain moments it's because when we meet 
uh, Inez, it's she's just been released from prison. Yeah, and she's staying at the shelter. And, and she... do we ever get a sense of why she was locked up? No. It seemed like she, it almost sounds like she took the fall for someone else about something, but the movie never really gets into the details of how she you ended know, up they're there. They're just like basically saying that like she had a criminal past, but she also happened to do hair, but because she has a criminal past, it can be difficult for her to get work. And it is also the fact of like, because of like her temperament, she doesn't do well when she's working under other people. Well, because at the opening of the movie, she goes back to the salon that she was working at before she got put in prison. And one thing I found very interesting, and I think it's something a lot of you know privileged white people like me don't necessarily think about, is her former boss was like, where have you been? And for someone like her, if she gets picked up off the street and thrown in prison, she's not going to be able to contact her employer and tell them. And so... When you're in these communities, you just have to get used to the idea that the people who have criminal backgrounds or are living on the fringes of society just disappear sometimes and you yeah. never see them again, possibly. It's also the underlining that we start to discover through Inez is that she does not have any family at all, like besides her son. That she grew up in the foster system. And she has no idea who she her parents no are. She has no idea who her parents are. She never developed close relationships. She has a few like friends here and there that she can depend on, but she, she has her like, son Terry. Yeah, she has her son Terry. So it's supposed to be like, who would have told her boss that she got arrested? And then, do we know Terry was just in the foster system? Was he living with someone at the beginning of the movie? No, it was just like he had a foster mom. Okay, because like, it's so brief, like that. Yeah, yeah, that I kind of forgot. Like, who who was he with? So. She decides on a whim to kidnap Terry. And what I thought was interesting was within a city as dense and as populated as New York City, you could do that and not even leave the city and be able to hide successfully. Well, especially because it's like it's in the 1990s when she takes him. Right? And yeah, And so things aren't as digitized yeah, and surveillance right. isn't as so she, robust as it is now. Like she sees him from afar. He's kind of like refusing to talk to her and she's telling him like, Things are going to change. I'm going to be around more often. And then Terry ends up in the hospital because she notices that he's not hanging around his friends. So she basically has to bribe information out of them. And they tell her that he was trying to run away from the foster mom and ran out of a window Yeah. in order to do that. So she goes to terry she gets him a gift he's kind of like that gift is corny i don't like it they start talking about what it is that he likes and that um he ends up like telling alec asking her like why do you keep leaving me and that's when the heartbreak starts settling in because she's trying to explain to him because you ran through the window you are going to be moved i don't know where yeah. you are going but it's because she knows the system well. well. She's already lived through the system. So she's like, you put yourself in danger. Now you're the foster mom's not going to want you around. Or they're going to think that like. You're you're, not, that's not a safe environment for you. It's not a safe environment for you. So I don't know where you're going to go. We're not going to see each other. And at the end, like when she's like, she gives it to him as an option. Do you just want to go with me? And he says, yes. And she takes them, and that's when well. That's when she goes. It's her friend Kim, I think, and then yeah. Miss Jones, who's Kim's mother. And yeah. I thought that was an interesting sequence because Miss Jones is not she, like she does not view Inez in a positive light. No, she sees her as her daughter's friend, who I can assume they grew up together. Was just a girl who got in trouble all the time, and that's all she kind of is. And Miss Jones is also has a lot of empathy for Terry. Yeah, But she doesn't want to see this little boy hurt even more than he already has been. And so what I liked was there's no one that's a bad guy in the movie. It's just people trying to maintain connections with each other and survive in a world that's constantly trying to, like, break those connections. Yeah, I thought that was one thing that was very interesting uh, interesting about the film is that there is... 
is the system that's uh, that's their enemy that is working against them. The one only person that you'd be like, yeah, that's a fucking fucked up dude is the landlord. But even then, he's not a part of that community. He's not really in the movie that much. No, and it's just like, and he's very subtle the way that he's doing well, everything. Yeah, and it's it's the way he's kind of tricking them into evacuating the apartment yeah. over time of oh there's just so many repairs we have to make so if you could leave and in a few months you can be moved back in and we all know and even Inez knows the minute she moves out of that apartment she's never getting back into it yeah exactly uh and then what's interesting is when they introduce lucky into the scenario which is Inez's boyfriend who was also in prison and he finally gets out and if this was a typical movie you would expect oh there's going to be you know a real violent clash between lucky and terry but what I love is that never happens. No. And that it's Lucky just seems to immediately understand because he probably felt the same things. Okay, this boy's mad at me because he sees me as coming in and trying to take his mom away from him. And so Lucky makes a concerted effort to prove to Terry that he is not there to take his mom and he's actually there to take care of Terry as well. Yeah, and I think it was, I do love the fact that there is a conversation between Inez and Lucky at the end of the day where she is she tells lucky like you need to bring terry into your life if uh because lucky tells her like i just came for you i did not know that there was going to be a tag along going on like i that was not what i expected and she's like well if you want me then terry is a part like like we come in a pair and it is like this touching thing of watching this boy who had no one suddenly become part of this family and the reminder that Lucky has because, you know, they get married, they're having very much like, a you know, like lower class yet like working very poor. working poor celebratory like um, wedding where people are taking photos of them. They're dressed up to the nines and like Terry, who's in a corner kind of pouting, Lucky goes over and it's just like, hey, my promise to like to this is not just Inez is to you too like you are a part of her so I'm going to take care of you I'm going to love you and once we see Terry getting older we do see that love and connection that they do have well it almost comes to the part where he feels more of a connection to Lucky than he does Inez at a certain point and that's completely understandable because he's an adolescent male he's looking up to Lucky who is in the neighborhood who like as he's growing up he's seeing that people think lucky's cool yeah like that lucky is well liked within the neighborhood that you know women talk to him and flirt with him and that like he knows all this music stuff and he has a like he's very suave in the way he, he goes about and i liked speaking of music the score for this movie is fantastic yeah. it's not the score you would expect for this kind of a movie because the kind of things you think of usually when you see, okay, it's a you know a very black culture focused movie. So you're thinking, okay, so there's gonna be a lot of hip hop. No, uh, is it gonna be like a, a Barry Jenkins movie with that kind of Nicholas Brittell soundtrack? Nope. I don't know how to describe the score to this movie. There's a mix it's, of like it's orchestral. Yeah. Well, it's I think what it does is it ties in to another element in the movie, which is. Terry becomes really interested in Quincy Jones and Quincy Jones work in scoring films. So like yeah. the whiz and things like that. And I realized once the movie kind of explicitly starts talking about Quincy Jones, that's what I was hearing. It's a sound from the 1970s yeah. that you don't hear in movies often, but it is a sound that came out of black culture. It just has not been attended to much in recent years. And Terry's interest in going into music is tied to the music he hears in Lucky's collection, which is this music. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was just a really great element. And it makes the film like it really does a lot to build the atmosphere of the movie, this particular score. I think you called it like a sad dream. Or yeah, like, it felt like, like a it was a terrifying dream. No, it was a tragic dream. Yes. That's what it feels like because it doesn't feel scary. It doesn't feel like you're not happy. Tense. It's just kind of feels like this wistful kind of if only things could just be frozen where they are, but they yeah. can't. And so we just have to keep kind of moving forward. 
and just like that kind of feel to the music. Yeah. Uh, and I really, really like that element of it. Uh, I thought the first hour of the movie was the strongest part of the movie, which yes, is when Terry's about eight or nine years old. Mm -hmm. And then when the time jumps start happening, that's especially the last time jump where we have Terry, I guess he's about like a high school senior at this point. Yeah. That's where, and the movie kind of gets a little dicey for me mm -hmm. because the chemistry between Tiana Taylor and Aaron Kingsley Atatola, who played the youngest version of Terry, is lost when we bring in these new actors. And I, that's where I felt there was kind of a, that moonlight connection where it's, oh, we have three different actors playing the same kid. But you don't have a focus on that character in the way that Moonlight focuses so tightly on its main character. Well, it's also with Moonlight, it felt as if all the actors were able to watch each other and then mimic certain behaviors. Yeah, and this each... Jerry doesn't have yeah. something that really correlates and goes, okay, this is the same character. He's they feel not... disconnected in the performances. Yeah, because it's like, we get from Terry as a young child just being like, kind of being left alone as Ines goes to work. And like a young teenager. And like, you know before like he becomes a, a young teenager and then it's just like suddenly we're jumping into his teenage years and it turns out like oh they're gonna send him to like equivalent of a magnet school and i'm not saying like oh that terry couldn't have become smart but it's just like we needed to see at the least if it was a way of montage of like him like reading a lot of books or and this like making sure he goes to the library like yeah, I, I didn't get the sense of how he, like, how was he practicing his love of music every day, other than just listening to the records? And I think the love of music becomes something that happens a little later, but I think there's also, like, this disjointed thing because of the love of music, we don't see him trying to practice an instrument, which would have been a little bit more yeah. vital if we're going to have someone say, like, they're going to go into that type of stuff. And especially if he's in school, I mean, he's going to have band opportunities, and they're going to yeah. provide him with, I mean, instruments that are not in the greatest condition, but he'd still have something at home that he was Yeah, and it's also on. just watching, like, the sacrifices that Inez does. And the thing is, like, there's never a question that Inez does sacrifices, because, for example, she talks about how much she loves doing hair, and she's good at it because like afterwards when she does it like on a freelance basis people tell her like that their confidence is built up when she's done it that she's great at it but she sacrifices the thing that she loves to go be like a cleaner at an old uh people's home because it's gonna pay her regular money and it's implied that like that's what she's doing all the way to the end of the movie yeah and it's like how she got the job when she found a, a room to stay in because like the woman that the black woman that she's staying with this was a little bit older who has her own grandchild living with her has this understanding of her is sort of like well i've struggled too i can get you a job then and uh, well and that parallels with mrs jones because you have mrs jones who's immediately judgmental of inez and not wanting to trust her and then we have this landlady who sees in and as like, no, this woman's really trying hard. She's trying to like make a life yeah, and she needs help. Like, so, so the landlady, she's sort of like, all right, you can make me look like a fool, whatever. But at the least I'm going to give you a chance to actually do the right thing and do the right thing like by your son. And like that is a moment again about within like the community taking care of each other despite the fact that there's going to be judgment within the community um there are a few things that are just kind of left hanging which was kind of confusing for me um like for example lucky gets sick in the film and, and we don't really get a wrap-up as to what's going on yeah i didn't get a sense if like were we supposed to infer that he died because does any i don't feel like anyone ever really talks about it well i think it like he does because they have okay. like that but it's oh yeah 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 yeah. now i remember they do yeah but it's yeah it was done in a weird way especially with that relationship between lucky and terry that it doesn't feel like it had that moment of oh okay this is over now yeah especially because it's supposed to be well lucky's moping around because no like it's terry's moping around because uh like lucky's gone and like then it turns out that like terry like that lucky had a child with someone else 
and how Inez is completely fine with it, which is like, I'm okay with Inez being as fine uh, about it. It's just like, they never have a conversation. There's never. Well, it was just something scene. that happened yeah. apart from her. Yeah. And she realizes he's gone now. This woman loved him. Like she doesn't go, well, I loved him and you didn't really love him. She knows she can't pass that sort of judgment. Yeah. And it's just like, he and had a I child with her. Like, she loved him. I can't reject this one. Yeah, woman. and it's sort of like, I think there needed to be a scene between Aness and Terry um, because it's like this thing of it being like, there are things in the film where, for example, Terry is like, I just like Spanish girls. And Aness is sort of like, she is a dark-skinned Black woman. And so she's like... But her name is Aness de la Paz. So yeah. we're thinking... Uh, has some sort of Afro-Caribbean background. Yeah, and it's just sort of like, she's kind of like, I don't want you to have this idea that, you know, just because the girl, like, needs to be lighter than you, then it has to be okay. Because he does not share the fact that he likes a girl who happens to be dark-skinned and tries to avoid the comment on it because all his friends are dumb and are, like, self-hating Black people at, to some degree or like racist in their own ideology or what do they call it um when it's racist about skin tone um i forgot what it was that's called i can't think about it Sorry. um we're not gonna say the there's a reveal at the end yeah. of the movie and we're not gonna spoil it nope. right we're not gonna say <laughs> uh but what how did you feel about that reveal i think it strengthen some uh, like key scenes at the beginning um also the fact that like Inez sacrifices her her way and then you get this reveal that you're just sort of like oh wow and but again it's like the sad thing is because of the reveal because the older Terry is not such a good actor yeah it sort of fizzles a little bit and so all out that weight of it is like on like Inez's shoulder and it feels bad because like again they don't have that chemistry so it just feels like she's talking against a wall yeah she's performing and he's like forcing himself to pout kind of yeah it's supposed to be it, he's supposed to be crying and it but yeah it, like it was not, not good even, like a glistening in the eyes it felt like yeah fake acting crying yeah. but i like on the paper i love that twist because it i think it does it redeemed the movie when i thought it was kind of going off the rails a little bit in that yeah, second yeah. half and it brought me back around i think it does recontextualize the opening scenes of the movie in a way that makes them even better than they already were. Yeah. Uh, and then the way she and Terry walk off together at the end of the movie, I thought was a perfect ending. It didn't matter this thing that they discovered or that he discovers about himself. That's fine. And yeah, it's, it makes me interested to see what this uh, director does next. Yeah. Like, the one thing that I, I mean, despite everything, you almost wish that was a little bit more tightened in certain, uh, like, maybe add one scene, remove a few others, but there's so much potential as to what can be told in the future, especially, like, with that soundtrack being what it was, like, the we, acting. She that, knew how to set the tone and the atmosphere better than a lot of people who've been making movies for years. Yeah, and it didn't feel like it it wasn't like overwhelming a lot of times when people try to depict um an urban setting because they always want to just be like there's music in the background there's cars honking you know you feel crowded as like no there's plenty of times you'll be in a room and it's just quiet and there's still up for discussions about culture like there's still things that like conversations that you have and it is important to have that feeling because a lot of times whenever i see like urban culture on tv you almost feel kind of like you want to cringe and it doesn't feel authentic and this oh. felt way more yeah. none of this felt stereotypical no uh and i also kind of like that it takes place before during and after 9 11 and 9 11 never really gets brought up and i kind of like that because it was sort of yeah 9 11 was a major moment in new york but people also had lives going on too and so there were it was more than that was happening uh, but yeah, it's A.V. Uh, Rockwell is the director, and I'm I'm very interested to see what she does next. Mm -hmm. 
And we're back. We'll be talking now about Return to Soul. This is directed by Cambodian French director Davy Chow. A 25-year-old French woman returns to South Korea where she was born for the very first time. She decides to look for her biological parents, but her journey takes a surprising turn. Uh, Ariana, what did you think of Return to Soul? Um, I think it was a pretty good movie. There were some weak spots, and it's hard to get over the weak spots because the first start of the movie is great. Then there's several time jumps, and we don't get the same essence as it was before. Only a continuation of self-destruction. Yeah, in the same way that 1001 starts to weaken when we start jumping through time, I definitely felt that here. I think Return to Soul has like the best first 10 and a half minutes I've seen on film all year from like a new movie. Yeah. It had me so excited watching the opening of that movie because it doesn't have the feel that you're expecting it's going to have. The acting is so strong. And even the first hour of the movie, I was in it. I thought it was developing in an interesting way. The situations were complex and you were really you were following a character freddie uh played by jimin park who is so good in this role and then that first hour ends and then we jump a few years and all of a sudden it was like every bit of energy that i had liked about the movie in my opinion just deflated yeah, it was like kind of like a Jenga tower. Like you it start collapsed. Yeah, it starts collapsing. You can feel like the weak spots. And it's clear like that's the direction the director wanted to go, but that's not the direction I wanted it to go based on the first hour. And so I kept sitting there trying to think, okay, well, when is the director gonna kind of realign with that first hour? And never really does. There's like a one moment that I felt like the film was kind of getting back on track and then that just doesn't really go anywhere and then the movie's over. Mm-hmm. Uh, I w- will say Jimin Park, uh, it does an incredible acting job in this movie. Yeah, and it's, this is like her first film. She's a plastics artist and I guess she's friends with Davy Chow, the director, and this is her acting debut. And from like the first minute she's on camera, she is compelling. Yeah, You want to watch her. You want to see what she's going to do. She... The thing that I loved was that this is a French film and you're watching it and you have all these people of South Korean descent on screen. And so I think about all the South Korean movies I've seen, but tonally, this is not that this is tonally a French film. Yeah. And that's like a hard thing to explain to listeners who might not have watched a lot of either. But if you do, I think you'll understand what I'm saying. There's just a certain energy that you get from French films is different from the energy you get from a South Korean movie. And you get that energy from her. So she challenges your expectations as a viewer because as a white man, I see her. I'm like, oh, that's a South Korean woman. But that's not how she acts. No. And you realize very quickly because she's more comfortable speaking French because that's what she's fluent in. She doesn't know South Korean that she's a French woman. That is who she is in terms of her mind and her perspective on the world. Mm -hmm. And that's where the drama of the movie comes out of is that culture clash when she comes to uh, South Korea. I also want to point out another performance of the movie that I think is really strong. And I was sad that this character leaves the movie after the first hour was Guka Han, who plays Tenna, Mm -hmm. the first person that uh, Freddie meets. She goes to like a hostel and Tenna works at the front desk and they strike up like a friendship almost immediately. Yeah. And that's part of that first 10 minutes. And there's just something about Guka Han's performance, her look in this movie. What it's again, another like compelling person that you want to watch. Yeah. I think it's, there's such a like contrast between the two of them. Mm-hmm. And it's also this understanding that like Tenna doesn't like <laughs> use Eddie as Freddie. Like, Freddie is basically, like, out of her realm. And it is... Yeah, she's like, you look like me, but you're not like me. Yeah, and so it's this interesting thing that because of ways of suggestions, um, she brings Freddie to a bar uh, with a friend. They're speaking French. 
they're talking about the customs of serving each other drinks and how it is rude to serve your own drink because you're indicating that you're not having like you you don't like being around the people like you're not way. part of the community yeah and freddie and like form of rebellion keeps service and like serving her own drinks not allowing like to like have other people serve her um it is this type of rebellion that like people admire about her, but you could see with Tenet there is like a hesitation of sorts of trying to almost like, wait a second, you are not within the culture that you're used to. You need to start to blend in a little bit, but Freddie is constantly like, but I am French. And it is this, and because she's like, is, this is supposed to be a setting where she is in South Korea um tenna cannot explain to her like well even though you are technically french i don't know what would a white french person say about you at the end of the day or like everyone here sees you and they see a south korean woman because they yeah. even make a comment you have a typically south korean yeah, face they tell her that she has a classically korean face that is the type of face that they would probably put on posters to indicate you are in south korea but here everything about who she is internally is in complete opposition yeah, to the culture even she's her in. clothing, even the way like she handles herself, like everyone is straightening their hair. She sort of has some waves in her hair, so she lets her hair uh, like be natural. The women dress very feminine, loose fitting clothing, and she dresses more in a masculine um, area as um sex is sort of like not prohibited but not really something that you celebrate you're almost supposed to be like ashamed of it freddie is out like openly having sex and like talking to the guys like as they are equals but there's also that thing that i found very interesting between the cultures is there is a coldness that they both share mm, there's yeah. a coldness about freddie that's very much linked to french culture the french culture but it also links to korean culture yeah because like the french way it's this sort of emotional distance you're kind of like in observation mode yeah like you can drink you can have fun you can fuck but you know you're with... never vulnerable you're never opened yeah. up and then the korean people everything is very there is an etiquette that is just known by everyone because they've grown up in this culture and you just follow the etiquette and to not follow the etiquette is seen as being extremely rude. Yeah. Uh, I think the, uh, what I find so interesting is where the movie begins, where it's just tight close-ups, her antenna. And we don't know how she got here. We don't know who Tenna is at first. It's just these two women of Korean descent talking to each other mm -hmm. in French. Um, and then as more details come out about how Freddie ended up in Seoul, that's what I found to be really fascinating is that her showing up in Korea was never something she overtly intended to do. Mm -hmm. that she had booked a flight to japan there was a typhoon so they couldn't send her to japan so they just allowed her to go to korea that was yeah, what she they picked. gave her like a list of places and she and picked she, korea and she clearly like she wanted to go to asia and she knows she's korean of uh, by her ethnic background because you know her parents have never hidden that from her and it's very clear she goes there and she does not have the intent to seek out her biological parents. She's just in Korea. So from my perspective, the film doesn't really make it explicit. It was more, she just kind of thought, I just want to see what it's like in Korea. Yeah. And that was the extent. Then as she's talking to other Korean young people, they start to bring up things about the major adoption agency in the region and how you can go there and they can get in communication with your biological parents if you want and they can set up meetings if the parents decide they want to meet with you yeah and so she just at every step you can tell she's not planning what she's going to do she's not necessarily envisioning an outcome she's just kind of like oh well i'm here i i guess i'll do that and it just keeps snowballing yeah. and what i love about her performance is 
the moment when they're on the bus headed out of Seoul to meet with her biological father for the first time. And she has that freak out. Mm -hmm. And it plays so authentic to me because she's doing something that's incredibly rude to get up in the middle of a bus and start shouting at the driver to turn around and go back to Seoul. Mm -hmm. And so Tenna has to calm her down. But like the way she plays it, where she's like, she has this kind of sneaky grin on her face it's clear that she's trying to exude an air of like i I, i'm fine i'm fine i'm just kind of being silly but you realize no she really is freaking out she's realizing she's about to engage in an encounter that will alter the rest of her life because she's going to meet the man that was her father the one who dropped her off at the adoption agency who will possibly tell her why her mother wasn't present or why her mother hasn't responded to the adoption agency or just what are his expectations of her. Mm -hmm. And we find out that uh, he expects that she will just assimilate into Korean culture and that she's going to stay and she's going to become his full daughter. And she makes it very clear almost right away. No, she is going back to France. She is not staying here. I love the part where he was like, Oh, and we'll, we'll find a husband for you. We'll marry you. Mm -hmm. And it's everything that terrifies her. Yeah, it's also like the way that she falls into it. Because I think even though everything is spontaneous in a way, I think you can tell like she has been thinking about this because she carries the photo with her. Like the photo that... Oh, there's a woman holding her in the photo. In the photo who she assumes is her mother. She brings it to her with the adoption agency. The adoption agency is asking her, do you have your file number? Do you have the copy of your adoption papers? Uh, And like, she can't answer until she brings up the photo and the photo by chance happens to have her file number on there. So she's able to print everything. And the woman tells her, oh, by the way, we sent a telegram to your parents allowing them to know that you have been looking into them. They assume that's why she was there. And she immediately freaks out because she's like, I didn't ask for this. Why did he do it? And she's like, because if you came here for your adoption files, this is the reason. And she's like, but just give me their addresses then and I'll figure. And she's like, no, we have to get permission from your parents to know if they want to see you or not. That is why a telegram is sent out to them. And and we use their social security numbers and to figure out where they are. And you could tell, like, there is a panic on her deciding because, like, her acquaintances are like, hey, you should go look into this. And it's deeply sad because the adoption agency, they're not even guiding her because she's a 25-year-old and they're not going, hey, wait a minute. Have you, did you think this through? When I think that's, that's the key to understanding Freddie. She never planned any of this. So she didn't come to Korea with the goal of doing any of this. It's just kind of happening and she's going along with it as it happens. Yeah. And I think that's the key to understanding who Freddie is. She never really planned anything in her life. She's just kind of allowed life to unfold around her. And that is like one of her it's a strength but it's also a problem yeah and i think it also within the 10th uh minute like of the film it you she's explained to you because she starts talking about a music theory that it's sort of like that you get to the point that you need to bail like you need to stop because it's overwhelming so that's when then the scene she gets everybody to sit together at the bar and like you know it starts like orchestrating the orchestrating people in the, the bar thing, yeah. and it's just sort of like to the point that it's too overwhelming and that chaos would ensue but and- like and we have to think she didn't plan that though she's sitting at the table with tenna and her friend and it's just you can tell she kind of doesn't something's rubbing her the wrong way about this culture mm-hmm. and then she just decides i'm gonna fuck everything up in this bar not in a way that people get in a fight or anything but she's going to play with the elements that are laid out before her yeah and just create something chaotic and she doesn't know what it's going to be but it will be different than what's happening right now yeah and so like she doesn't she doesn't care quote unquote about people's perception of her because like in korean they're like is she crazy is she drunk is she on any drugs 
And because they're just following suit because she's making these demands. But she's not following the social script that they're used to. But and like that they're not she's not following. But it's also the fact that she's unwilling to follow their script. Yeah. She's unwilling to actually listen to what they're trying to tell her. And like they they try to play games with her about being like, hey, in Korea, we do like this game. And she's just looking at them like, you're dumb. You're so dumb. And like she clearly looks down on Korean people. And it's like, and it's sad because it's like in 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 a way she's looking down on herself. Yeah. Well, because then one of the weird twists when we do the time jump, and it's one of those things I'm still kind of like, I don't think I like this element. <laughs> Was the arms dealer twist? Yeah. I still don't understand. Like that, it feels like it comes out of nowhere. And it's through like a Tinder date. Like, I don't understand that at all. Maybe I need to go back and like rewatch that scene to get a sense of what's going on. It was all over the place because it's supposed to be, she goes on a date on her birthday because she's just like, I don't like my birthday. I'm going to go hang out with this, uh, this guy who, uh, who happens to also be a French person who tells her he's an arms dealer and that she's working for some like corporation, um, like on the Korean front, like relating to French stuff, but it's sort of like a, she's a Trojan horse. Like they think, oh, they're gonna get someone who doesn't understand French culture, but boom, she's she's. But in but the- she's someone who to them she oh they'll see her as Korean, which means that'll be our end to sell more of these weapons. Yeah, um, it's like she's she's not working with that guy. But I mean, and, that's yeah. like the what of where it eventually goes yes. that's why she is eventually hired. and we find out that she has been in korea for the past two years and it was it implied that she ever left no i think she okay never that's what left. i was thinking she just stayed in seoul but she never st- kept up communication with her father and, and her the, mother has still never replied and the thing is like it's supposed to be three telegrams per year by the six one if she doesn't respond they close the case they she cannot have contact. So with the implication her. she stayed and sold because she was waiting to see if the mother would ever get back in yes. contact with her. But she it feels to me that she doesn't want to admit that's why she stayed. No, she doesn't want to admit it, and then she's like will kind of ignore any text messages from her father. She has declared even beforehand that getting messages from him disgusts her because she's like he's constantly apologizing. And this is before, like, Tenna, before the time jump, is trying to explain to her, like, that's just the way of Korean men is they're going to constantly apologize to you because they did something wrong until you forgive them. And she has no plans to forgive And she's like, I'm not interested in being friends with him. So afterwards, during the time jump, she's looking at her emails going to, like, spam part part because she's blocked her father and he's constantly email emailing her giving her updates sending her photos of him with her two half sisters and she starts laughing with like this pain because it's supposed to be yeah i'm also like she's gonna start crying in that scene. yeah and she's laughing because the person that she wants to know from has had the final telegram and it's basically indicated to the adoption agency i do not want to know this person only to get this too much attention from her father yeah and so it's she could have a relationship with him but she doesn't then we have another time jump yeah and i think that like i did like the scene where she does finally sit down with her dad again i like i liked the way that scene played out because all of a sudden there's kind of a reversal happening because as they learn more about who she is now he has less interest in wanting to have a relationship with her well it it doesn't have to do with her they seem like they're fine and happy with her until her boyfriend opens his mouth and he is a white french man he's a white french man who tells um who basically tells them like when she's explaining her job and she's trying to be like oh it's for peace and she's like oh you know but you know freddie believes that like that this was like her what was it like basically her destiny to or destiny to like defend the south korean people from like our northern enemies or something it was to come to korea in order to work with a like a weapons manufacturer and it's it misunderstands that there is a large portion i believe of the south korean community that 
sees reunification as the goal one day, not this constant division and war between South and North yeah. Korea. And the, you can just see in the father's face and the rest of the family, they're like, oh, no, she and this guy do not get it at all. Yeah. They don't understand what it is we believe about our neighbors to the north. I think it was a moment of shame for her. So when they're in the car, she looks at her boyfriend, who funny enough, like at the beginning, she's like, this place is toxic for me. Thank you so much for coming with me. She's meditating. And then in the taxi, she's like, I can erase you from my life with like a snap of my finger. Well, she kind of does what she did in that first hour, especially the first 10 minutes of I'm going to create a chaotic moment mm -hmm. because I feel uncomfortable. I don't like what's happening. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fuck things up in this place and change the tone of everything. Yeah. But I'll know that I changed it. I'm in control of it. Mm -hmm. What did you think of the final scene of the movie? Because it's very short. And I, I still am not 100% sure what the implication there is. I felt as if it was a complete, like, showing that, like, she had to go back to who she was before. um, Like, before she came to Korea of sorts. Because, like, it's it's indicated throughout the whole movie with conversations that she's had with different people that she's approached going to her biological parents the wrong way. Because like, okay, she meets another uh, adopted French-Korean woman who says like, oh, the agency told me to move here first, learn the language, learn the culture, and then once I felt comfortable, contact my yeah. biological parents, which is the total opposite of what Freddie did the entire movie. Yeah, and it's like, and Freddie also tries to create chaos within that woman's life Yeah, as a response to it, even though like when she hugs her, it feels like very familiar, very loving, but then within a few minutes, <laughs> like Freddie's like, I'm going to fuck up your life because I'm unhappy. And it is a moment that like when Freddie does basically sending a message to be like I, I i feel like i am finally happy it's like she gets nothing in return and she has to depend on herself and it can be increasingly frustrating because it's like before that final one um, scene we do see her have a conversation with her mother and her mother is like her adopted mother is lovely very caring very like forgiving towards her but it almost was like it's too late yeah this should have happened earlier and because it didn't happen when it should have it's not going to provide freddie with what she thought she needed because she's changed now yeah and i think it's also because like freddie is running on like chaos and self-destruction that is what she's feeding off of it. And it's like that implication of being in your 20s and trying to find yourself and trying to find what your culture is. But it's also hard when you're rejecting that culture every single time. You're slapping it in the face, basically saying, I don't love you. And what does that say? In a way, you're saying you don't love yourself. And and like in the final scene, she's not dolled up anymore. She's, she's completely isolated. She's completely isolated. We're assuming she no longer works for the weapons manufacturer. She's in a very desolate, frozen place. Yeah, and she starts playing the piano. And it's is it the same song that her biological father wrote for her? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's this she yearns for that connection, which we can feel it's gone. Yeah, like that she's never going to have that connection and she finally came around to understanding what that she needed it too late mm -hmm. and so it makes it very much a tragedy uh would you recommend return to soul yeah i think the thing is just to watch the acting and to see it done it's also that it, like you were saying before you could have this expectation of it being a korean slash asian style but it is very french at the end of the day there's times that they almost want to like psych you into thinking oh mm -hmm. now it's going to be a little bit more this there's a few shots that feel that way and then it goes back to being a french film with the colors with the framings just with the way that her character is portrayed yes. it feels very french mm -hmm. uh but yeah i would recommend it too it's despite the parts of it that i didn't like and the parts i thought were weak the parts that are strong 
are so incredibly strong yeah that it overrides the parts i didn't like to the where i would go i think people should watch this movie well that was the pop cult podcast for this week we hope you enjoyed our show make sure to check out our show notes for links to anything we might have talked about including our website popcult.blog i'll also be linking uh, a clip of the first 10 and a half minutes of return to soul in the show notes this week so you can check that out and see what we were talking about in our review uh, speaking of our website, popcult.blog, we've got some things going on there this month. Uh, all August is our flashback to 1983. Uh, coming up in the next week, we'll be doing reviews of The Big Chill, uh, Local Hero, and Mike Lee's Mean Time. Also, we have uh, a review of the Netflix series Beef, uh, as well as more of our Morkborg solo tabletop roleplay playthrough. Uh, if you enjoy what we do on the podcast and on popcult.blog, we'd encourage you to think about supporting us on Patreon. We've got lots of different tiers for you to join, uh, anywhere from $3 up to $20. Uh, I want to thank our patrons, uh, Morphine, who donates at our sneak preview level, uh, Becca and Matt, who donate at our $10 writer's room level. And if you donate at that level or higher, you get to pick one movie a month for me to watch and review. You can add your own thoughts if you want to do that as well. If you do subscribe to our Patreon, you'll also immediately gain access to um, all current and future patron-exclusive podcast episodes. We've got two series there right now. We'll be starting up a third patron-only podcast coming up at the end of September. Well, until next time... Keep listening.